how it's all right. <laughs> so anyway, this is my brother Brian Connors, and uh, I thought uh, it might be fun to have him come and tell some stories about uh, the Peace Corps and Africa and Alaska, and maybe you have some questions too. That's good. Oh, thanks. Um, okay. Brian Connors, this is probably the tenth time you've heard my name. Um, I live in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Do you guys know where that is? You know where Tanzania is? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Where? Below Kenya. <laughs> okay, above Mozambique. All right. You got you passed. Just had a quiz. You just had a quiz. All right, perfect. All right, we're going to go over some map stuff. I'll show you some maps. Um, yeah, I grew up in Duxbury. I came home for the holidays with my family, and um, I am... The title of my job with Peace Corps is Peace Corps Safety and Security Officer. So I work with uh, seven different countries in East Africa and the Indian Ocean, and my primary responsibility is supporting Peace Corps uh, staff and Peace Corps volunteers in maintaining a safe lifestyle where they live and work, and I help Peace Corps programs develop safety trainings and implement safety and security trainings for staff and volunteers uh, themselves. Not just safety for the volunteers, but also physical security. Like when I came in here today, I had to sign into the office. Uh, there's certain protocols you have to follow. We have the same sort of things that uh, the Martha's Vineyard School District has. So, um, so what I want to do today is just... Um, first, I want to find... Uh, there it is. Um, I'm going to go back to the beginning. How do I do that? There we go. Okay. So, um, yeah, Tanzania is right below Kenya. Um, I, I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya uh, back uh, in 1990 to 1993. Um, well, let me first ask, uh, have any of you considered anything like, or are you thinking about Peace Corps? Or are you thinking about living overseas or traveling overseas at all? You are? Uh-huh. <laughs> Kevin is? Always, right? Maybe in a little while. Every yeah. summer? <laughs> what about you? What, what, are you? what are you sort of thinking about? Uh-huh. Oh, really? We're in Turkey. Wow. Cool. That's great. Um, and you? Yeah, I just want to travel. Uh-huh. That's great. Well, Peace Corps is a great way to travel, I can tell you that. It's a super way. And who else raised their hand? Did anybody else? Um, ha have you thought at all about something like AmeriCorps? You guys know what AmeriCorps is? AmeriCorps is a national community service program. I was an AmeriCorps director for nine years in, in Alaska, as Chris said. So I can talk a little bit about that as well. It's another way of providing, uh, is volunteering or um, engaging in community service work, but you don't have to go overseas, unless you go to a place like uh, Alaska, which is kind of like going overseas, you know. Um, but there are lots of opportunities, and in this day and age, whether you're going to college, whether you're going to trade school, whether you're going to start work right out of high school, some kind of community service, um, my feeling is some kind of community service is vital to being involved in the community itself. Um, and so AmeriCorps is a great way to do it because you get a living allowance, you get a, a stipend, um, health insurance, and all that stuff. And potentially you get, after a year or two of service, you get money to pay off student loans or to, to go to um, school. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite a good benefit for that. I think it's, now it's like $6,000 a year that you get as an educational allowance that allows you to go to um, college or trade school or you know, community college or anything. It's a really good benefit. Um, and Peace Corps, of course, is after a university, or um, most cases. I think 97% of Peace Corps volunteers have college degrees, and 3% don't, but they have a special skill or trade that's in, uh, in demand. And that is usually something these days like um, uh, web design, internet, uh, maybe engineering, or maybe not engineering, but um, you know, heavy machinery, something that where you're going to train someone in a developing country to, to do a skill that... Uh, that's in high demand. Okay. So I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya. Um, I was a history major in college. Okay. So I was not like a doctor or a nurse or a teacher for that matter. Um, 
But I'd lived in Alaska for seven years, and I used the pit latrine all the time, and I bathed out of a bucket, so they thought I could do uh, uh, do what I they wanted me to do. So I spent uh, three years in, in Peace Corps in Kenya, and I was a health and sanitation volunteer, and I taught people how to build pit latrines. So I mean, if I could do it, by God, you know, I think anybody could do it. So, um, and then. Uh, from, so that, that was from 1990 to 1993. And then 1993 to 1996, I lived in Tanzania, and I worked uh, running a community wildlife conservation project in the Serengeti National Wildlife uh, Reserve, which is pretty cool. You guys know where the Serengeti is? I'll show you on the map. All right. You guys watch the National Geographic Channel, like the big cats, or you know, watching the wildebeest? And... Okay, well, you will have to do that for homework. Um, anyway, Tanzania is one of the, probably one of the greatest wildlife destinations in the world, uh, for African wildlife, anyway. Um, and then in 2006, I lived in Alaska for 10 years, and then in 2006, my wife and I and our children went back to Africa. We lived for four and a half years in Malawi. I'll show you that on the map. You know where Malawi is? Right next to Mozambique. Okay. Um, so we were there for four and a half years, and I was environment program director. And after that, moved to Tanzania to take a, a position as training director. Um, okay. So Peace Corps is a national or international community uh, volunteer agency. It's, we are part of the U.S. government, um, but interestingly, it's uh, Peace Corps director sits on the cabinet, it's on the president's cabinet. It's an independent national agency. And our goals, we have three specific goals that were developed in 1961 by the, who was the president at the time? 1961, one of the, the founders of Peace Corps is John F. Kennedy. And, uh, and he, the three goals that came out of it are to help people in interested countries develop uh, their manpower or uh, you know, train the labor force, um, uh, increase and improve education, uh, and not for a Peace Corps volunteer to go in and actually do everything, but to go in and have a counterpart or a group of counterparts and to train people how to do things, right? Train people how to be better teachers, train uh, health workers how to be better health workers, etc. Um, the second goal is to promote a better understanding of Americans on the part of the people served. So a Peace Corps volunteer uh, uh, lives in the, uh, the country where she's living or he's living, and um, just by virtue of the fact that they're living in that country, living in a village or in a small community, uh, living with host country uh, national neighbors and, and working with people, they begin to uh, inform or educate people about what Americans are like, just by virtue of the fact that they're being there. Right? And then the third goal is to promote a better understanding of the people where Peace Corps volunteers serve on the part of Americans. So your grandmother, when she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Turkey, I, you might have heard her stories over and over again, right? Some. But I'm sure that she, in part of her you know, daily, or not daily, but part of her life is talking about her experience as a Peace Corps volunteer. And that's how people in uh, former Peace Corps volunteers, returned Peace Corps volunteers were called. That's how we train, or um, that's how we implement this goal, is to be talking about the countries where we served and worked and traveled and help Americans understand that uh, the world beyond the borders of America. Any questions so far? <coughs> so, um, so volunteers uh, these days serve in several different areas, and as you can see, by far the biggest area that they serve. Oh, wow! One of these things. Um, the biggest area is education. Most of that is primary education. Well, it might be a 50-50 split: primary, primary education and secondary education. So, and, and when we talk about education in secondary level, mostly these days we're talking about TEFL, teaching English as a foreign language, or English, straight off English, English sorry, English language uh, teaching. Some Peace Corps volunteers actually teach other teachers in maybe a teacher training college, uh, a university. So they're preparing 
host country teachers to become uh, better teachers and to have improved their uh, technical skills and such um, in, in the classroom. Uh, there's a lot of um, focus these days, uh, and it always has been with Peace Corps, on health. The fundamental key to development is health. A, a, a country and a people cannot develop properly unless there's a, health, a healthy workforce, a healthy, healthy student uh, population. And if, if people are struggling just to survive the, um, from the impact of HIV and AIDS, uh, malaria, uh, typhoid, TB, then this part, the education part, and especially the agriculture part, are really going to fall behind. So health is a pretty critical uh, aspect of what Peace Corps does. And honestly, in all of these areas of Peace Corps service, there are health activities built into all of them. So you might be a teacher, but Peace Corps is going to train you how to integrate health messages into your classroom teaching. You might be an agriculture volunteer and showing people how to build permagardens at their homes, but you're going to be doing health and nutrition as well. Same would be for environment. You're going to look at climate change potentially or wildlife conservation, but there's going to be health aspects in that because, again, health is so critical to, uh, to a nation's development. Um, there's community and economic development, which is we call, we used to call small business. So if you're, you have an inclination to train or teach in business and you have those skills, community and economic development is where you are. These days there's a big push for agriculture. And so, in, in fact, in many of these areas, if we're talking about health, we're, we're like, likely talking about agriculture as well. Um, kitchen gardens, we call them, places where women can take care of their, uh, uh, raise food at home without having to travel great distances into the uh, uh, agricultural areas so that they can maintain a good, healthy, diverse diet without having to um, be strained uh, by uh, time traveling or um, in many cases in urban or semi-urban areas you don't have large farms but people can still grow food at home. So agriculture is a big um, focus of Peace Corps. And there's an, uh, in Africa anyway there's a very big movement it's called Feed the Future and it's supported by the U.S. government under the U.S. Agency for International Development and USAID supports the Feed the Future program it's several billion dollars and a lot of it is, is um, focused toward access. So you might have a country where there's lots of food, but in some parts of the country there's no access. The roads are bad, transportation is non-existent. So improving access. And then um, improving people's understanding about how to grow food uh, uh, in the environment where they live. Uh, so this is, this is a, the current a list of uh, Peace Corps countries. Um, you can see in Af whoop. you can see in Africa, 43 percent. It's actually this year. It's 44 percent of the volunteers that serve today are serving in Africa. We're in 23 different countries. Although this country right here just got suspended two weeks ago, and Kenya has been suspended for a year and a half. Uh, and then we have some countries over here that we call the Ebola countries. You guys have heard about Ebola? Everybody's heard about Ebola. I mean, I mean, I'm sure that's why there are those, uh, um, you know, hand cleanser things here because everyone's paranoid about Ebola. Don't worry, you're not going to get Ebola here. Um, uh, but Ebola, three of the Ebola countries are not yet uh, back up and running. So. Um, we do suspend country programs now and again for different reasons. Usually it's a health or political uh, violence reason. Um, you know, political violence, but chaos. Yeah. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, very popular area for Peace Corps. We used to have many, many more programs, um, but, uh, but that's been scaled back a little bit. Um, the, 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 um, the primary language here would be what? Spanish. Um, there may be a Portuguese-speaking uh, country in here somewhere. I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, but um, we do have a Portuguese country here, Mozambique. You know Mozambique, um, and uh, but principally in Africa, the, the languages that a Peace Corps volunteer would learn 
are indigenous to that country. Okay. Um, and then, of course, um, Central Asia and Eastern Europe, we have a, a number of different programs, and then the Pacific Islands, uh, Micronesia, Philippines, Thailand, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Thailand down here um, in, uh, in, in Central Asia, um, China, oh, over here, Albania, uh, Georgia, a number of different countries in, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. I think in Africa we're in 23 different countries. Any questions? Um, so this is a map of Africa, obviously, um, and I believe it is uh, up to date. It is not up to date because look, you'll see here the Zaire. There is no Zaire anymore. It's called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So this I just grabbed off the web, and obviously I didn't look closely to see. <laughs> But it's still got the same borders. It's just not the. Uh, it's just not um, uh, called Zaire. Um, so here's Malawi down here. This next to the lake. This is the lake, Lake Malawi. That's where I lived for four and a half years. And this is Tanzania, where I live now. And this is Dar es Salaam, where our city where we live. So Tanzania is where I live now. And I can talk a little bit about what the programs are in Tanzania, the Peace Corps programs. So up here in this area is the Serengeti uh, Wildlife, uh, Serengeti National Park. And it borders Kenya. And over here is the, the Maasai Mara, which is a very famous national park. Um, and it's one ecosystem. So all the wildlife kind of circulates between these two ecosystems. And then there are some more here. The Maswa Game Reserve and the Ngorongoro uh, um, National Park uh, or conservation area. So they're all one big conservation area and ecosystem. So I live in Dar. Uh, we live in a nice house, and my children go to the International School of Tanganyika, uh, which is a local school, but it's international. Um, our 17 year old, I think she has one American in her class, and all the other kids are from. Belgium, Guatemala, India, Pakistan, China, Japan, from all over the world, Tanzania even. Um, and uh, I think the same is true for our youngest uh, daughter, Caroline. She's 10, and I think she's might be, there might be two other Americans in her class. 26 students, only two Americans. So it's very interesting the kind of the environment that they're learning in and, and such. Um, but we have volunteers uh, down in this part of the country, in Sangea and in Jombe, and over here by Mbeya. Um, and a lot of them are doing our teachers. We have teacher three programs in Tanzania, three principal Peace Corps programs: uh, education, secondary education, um, health, uh, and mostly working with HIV and AIDS uh, and malaria, and then other secondary activities like youth development. And then the third program is agriculture and environment. And the agriculture is mostly working with uh, women and, uh, and students to develop, um, build capacity or build their ability to, um, to improve their uh, food diversity and, um, and, uh, and crop availability near their homes. So that, again, they're not traveling great distances. Because women also, in the developing world, women travel great distances to get firewood. And what you don't want to do is further burden people by saying, we have to go 10 kilometers and grow your crops. And you have to go 10 kilometers to get firewood because it's too much time away from the home. Uh, the security is not so good in, in, uh, for women traveling great distances. And it's time wasted. So we're focused on helping people develop um, agricultural uh, uh, plots near their homes that serve their family's needs. Uh, Tanzania is about 50 million people. It's quite a big country. Uh, Kenya is probably somewhere around the same, um, but Kenya has only about 15 or 20 percent of the country is called arable land. That's land where people can actually farm and live on and subsist. Tanzania is significantly more than that. Um, this central region of the country is very dry, almost desert-like in some areas. Singida, it's just like driving through a desert. Um, and you come across, you know, trees and things like that around villages, but they're mostly introduced uh, 
um, at some point. There are native uh, trees and, and things, uh, cactuses, different um, you know plants like agave, which is similar to agave. Um, this, these areas here, these are called the Rift Valley Lakes, Malawi, uh, Lake Rukwa, Tanganyika, Lake Victoria, Lake Tana is up here in Ethiopia. These are Rift Valley Lakes. So this this part of the world was transformed by um, by uh, um, continental drift, I guess it is it called. I can't even remember now. But anyway, it's a rift, and so there's a, um, escarpments here that run uh, through this region up here, and these these lakes are all created millions of years ago um, by the tectonic plates, I guess, moving, and and it's there's a high degree of um, or there was a high degree of volcanoes, a uh, high number of volcanoes in the region. And there is, there are some volcanoes uh, still in this area. Empakai is one that's very active still. Um, okay, so this is the area that I work in. These are the countries that I serve, except Sudan and Somalia. I don't work in those countries. Um, Sudan has been uh, there's been a civil war in Sudan for a number of years. We looked at going back, Peace Corps did, about five or six years ago, but we're not going to go back for now. Um, but I work and support Peace Corps programs in Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya, the Comoros, which is three little islands here, and Madagascar. Um, can it, all right, you all see Madagascar, right? So what's Madagascar famous for? Don't say being across from Mozambique. Lemurs. Lemurs, right, yeah. So there's cool lemurs in Madagascar. And, um, and Madagascar is actually the most biodiverse country in the entire world. So when you're talking about the, the number of different species of wildlife, and plants, and insects, and bugs, and everything, Madagascar is the most unique country in the world. All, all, um, well, there's only one place in the world where lemurs exist, and that's Madagascar, and then on uh, the Comoran Islands. Comor uh, Comoros was, I mean, effectively it is part of Madagascar, it's part of the chain. Um, but all the, uh, what do you call them? They have uh, 104, I think, different species of lemurs. Um, and they're incredible to see in the wild. Um, but they're, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what this, I have pictures of these uh, animals later on. Uh, chameleons. The chameleons in Madagascar are, are unique, like no other place in the world. Um, and it's just amazing. And you, can, you can go through the forest or you can drive along the road and see, you know, at night you can stop and you can shine your light into the bushes and just see chameleons. And, you never see these things in the daytime, they're just like they're hiding, right? Um, but it's an incredible place to be. Um, the people in Madagascar came from uh, Indonesia and Malaysia over a thousand years ago. So there's a mix of different cultures and people. It's a very unique place in the world. I love Madagascar, it's fascinating. But um, as much as it is biodiverse, it's in danger of being uh, uh, um, uh, destroyed by logging, um, hunting for wild uh, animals, um, and uh, and tourists have of course brought their own impact as well to the country. So I work again with these seven countries: Madagascar, Comoro, Ten Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. Um, and then Malawi is right here on the edge of the lake here. So. Um, any questions about this part of the world? Okay. All right. I'm going to now show you what I think is really amazing. When you look at a map of Africa, what you typically see on a Mercator map, right? A Mercator map shows a little piece of Africa sort of at the bottom. But this is how big Africa is. Here's the U.S. Here's China. Look at this. China. The U.K. This is England. It's the size of Madagascar. India. So I work in a region that's like 
the size of part of Eastern Europe, India, and the United Kingdom. I mean, when people ask me why it takes so long to get from Tanzania to Ethiopia, I'm like, look, look, at, look at the map. <laughs> look at Germany, France, Spain. This is huge. So you take all these countries in the world. These are some of the biggest countries in the world and most populous. This is the square, yeah, square kilometers. So, I mean, Africa is an absolutely enormous place. Sixty-some countries, okay, so very unique in terms of language. There are over 2,000 languages, indigenous local languages in Africa. It's not one place, one language. Um, a place like Tanzania, there are 130 local languages in Tanzania. 130. 40 million people, 130 languages. Okay. Kenya is about the same. It's maybe 60 languages. Um, and in the northern parts of Kenya, where the Maasai, uh, the Turkana, the Samburu, the, uh, they live, uh, many, many people live in the northern uh, areas, uh, in the desert, um, and they're herders. Um, they speak very unique languages called Nilotic languages. And that language group comes from the Nile River, uh, valley. And uh, so there's 2,000 languages, over a billion people now in Africa. Um, I speak Swahili um, fluently. I've spoken Swahili for many years. I studied it in college. It was one, when I was your age, my, I had two goals in life. I, I wanted to live in Alaska and I wanted to live in Africa. And uh, when I finished college, I, I haven't lived any place else but those two places. Um, and I studied Swahili in college. And so I've been speaking Swahili for about 30, 35 years. I guess I'm dating myself, but yeah. Um, but this, you know, you can, you can go to Cameroon, which is, um, Cameroon, which is here. I, I mean, each one of the, I'm just, you know, I have been in many countries in this region. I've been to Senegal here, but there's a lot of the world to explore. The Democratic Republic of the Congo alone, hundreds of languages, and places that, you know, like in the Amazon, you know, parts of the Amazon where people have rarely explored. Again, this is just like Central Africa. I mean, it's it's wilderness, but there are people there. There are cultures of people living. And, um, it's a fascinating, to me, uh, a fascinating place. But when when I when I look at this, it's just amazing to see the size of the place, because you don't think, when you're looking at a map, you don't think that Africa is big, but it's huge. Um, all right. So, a little bit about Peace Corps and how Peace Corps operates. You have uh, a Peace Corps volunteer comes to service without, basic, maybe with some basic skills, but uh, with not a whole lot of understanding about the, the local environment where uh, the volunteer is going to serve. So we provide really intensive training over the first three months when they when the volunteers arrive. And it's called pre-service training. So you've got that three-month period of week. Um, depending on what country you're in, you're going to learn a language. Um, and this is one of the attractions to me when I was looking to be a volunteer. I wanted to learn a language intensely, not just you know, you know, so I could order something at a restaurant, but I wanted to. I wanted to really know a language, and that enables you to really know a community or a people, right? So in my case, I learned Swahili. Um, but Peace Corps trains, I think, in about 80 different languages, Russian, um, you know, Chinese, there's Mandarin, Cantonese, uh, all kinds of languages. Every country has its own language languages. Um, in Malawi, when I was the program manager for the Agriculture and Environment Program, we trained in four languages. So here you have an English speaker, maybe who studied French or Spanish or something before, and then at the end of three months of service, they come out speaking Chiyao, Chitumbuka, Chichewa, Chitonga, one of four or five different languages. And that's what they speak for the next four years, or two years, sorry. Um, so we also do a lot of cross-cultural training. What's it like to live in that culture? What are the... the um, uh, what are the cultural um, uh, 
aspects of it that are important for a volunteer to know, weddings, funerals, uh, we make sure that during Peace Corps training that they attend all of those things. They learn how to, how to um, you know, uh, greet uh, in, within the cultural context. They learn how to grieve. They go to a funeral. They go to weddings. Um, and, and they learn the important things in that culture that are going to help them to be a successful member of the community wherever they're, wherever they're living. Um, volunteers get technical training during pre-service pre training. In many aspects, your technical training is some ways secondary to all the other stuff because your first couple of months in service are going to be, are going to be, um, you're, you're going to integrate. You're going to find out what your community is like. You're going to learn more about the people that you're living with and working with. And the technical stuff will come maybe a little bit later. So you'll get a baseline, you'll get some technical training, and some of it's very intense, and it's enough to get you through the first couple of months of your service. And then after that, you'll get more training, uh, technical training at different points in your service, more intense technical training. Um, and we give volunteers a lot of safety and security training during that first three months of service. That's part of what I do. Um, but it's, it's integrated into everything that, uh, that, that staff and other training uh, uh, managers do. So, and at every, every couple of months as a Peace Corps volunteer, there's other types of training available for it. Well, we do a lot of health education training. Some of it might be uh, what's called Zinduka or grassroots soccer. Grassroots soccer is a way of training uh, youth, um, especially 10 to 17 year olds, on uh, healthy lifestyles, um, prevention of HIV and AIDS, malaria, that sort of stuff. And it's using soccer as a metaphor. So it's, it's not actually playing soccer, but it's using soccer as a way of teaching okay, um, health messages. Um, a lot of work in agriculture and food security, and even if you're a teacher, you can still take advantage of these kinds of training. Um, and these are, these are primarily, as I said, some of the main technical areas that these Corps volunteers serve in. Um, picture of someone teaching. I don't know what language that is. Huh. Okay, let me ask, are there any questions? I have some photos too I'm going to show because I, I take thousands and thousands of pictures and I could do nothing but pictures. But if you have questions, yeah, you think back to when you were in high school, what, what helped you prepare for this the most? Uh, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot, and I remember, um, actually, our father had a good friend who was in Colorado, and, and I was taking Spanish at the time. I think I was in eighth grade when I met this, this guy, and he had come to the house a couple of times, and he told me, similar to this, he told me all about Peace Corps, his Peace Corps service, and um, I just started taking Spanish, and I was like, well, I want to go to Central America and be in the Peace Corps, and he, he, uh, he brought me... Um, uh, a record, uh, uh, the Jungle Book, the Disney animated movie, he brought that in Spanish, and I committed myself to, to learning the whole thing in Spanish, and I did. But the whole idea of service, you know, going and, and, and being of service to, to a community somewhere was uh, important to me. But I wanted to travel. I wanted to see the world outside my bubble, you know. Duxbury is a bubble. The vineyard, it's a bubble, you know. Uh, it's a great place to learn, but it's there's a world out there that's fascinating, and and so I guess to, to back to your question, what prepared me? Is that what you're saying? I think um, I, I think uh, creative problem solving or critical thinking, creative problem solving, writing, learning to be a decent writer. You don't have to be a great writer, but just someone who can communicate. Learning a little bit about communication um, and. Patience. Uh, there's nothing that a Peace Corps volunteer doesn't need more than patience, uh, because nothing happens overnight. And your grandmother, as a Peace Corps volunteer, maybe still wonders. I wonder if that teaching lesson that I did for two years uh, in, you know, math. I wonder if that was useful to those students. You know, you still probably wonder. Did I do what I set out to do? But I think that with patience, uh, you're able to implement what you can in, in the community, um, and then and then you know just sort of you know lay it all out, be committed, be disciplined. I think discipline is a big 
uh, was a big factor for me. I was not the most disciplined uh, student. I mean, Chris is younger than I, but I was not the most disciplined. But I think learning to be disciplined, I, both in my studies and my and my daily life, was important to being successful in, in this because you have to stick to it um, and you have to be committed to it. And um, if you don't have uh, if you don't have that, if you don't if you don't feel committed and disciplined um, in what you're doing, it, it you can struggle because then you develop impatience. Then you become less patient and able to. Uh, to kind of go with the flow. Yeah. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Um, I was just going to add something to what you said. Maybe it gives you the opportunity to study abroad when you're in high school oh, and yeah. in college. Mm -hmm. um, my younger daughter actually last night arrived home from Tanzania. Oh, she you're kidding. She studied abroad in Tanzania for four months. Oh, and wow. the picture she showed me last night before she crashed were amazing. Oh, my um, gosh. Wow. So yeah. I was hoping she was going to come today. Oh, yeah. Um, but just taking that opportunity to right. experience different cultures, right. you live with the society and for a few days, and um, did yeah. amazing things that I yeah. didn't know about. So taking that opportunity um, right. to study abroad and experience different cultures really, really well. That's exactly right. If any opportunity you can get to go somewhere, to travel, take it. It'll expand your way of thinking. It'll expand your um, commitment to what you want to do in your life anyway. It'll bring you different ideas, different ways of thinking about the world or your own little world, wherever you're living. Um, you know, just being open to experiences is, is critical in developing, um, uh, developing along the way toward being whatever you want to be. I mean, being open... But international travel, or just travel, if you want to go to New Mexico, or if you want to go to Colorado, or Washington State, I mean, just getting out of wherever your community is, is important. Meeting different people, finding out what their cultures are like. We have thousands of different cultures in the United States, hundreds of different languages in the United States, and um, we're not all the same. So traveling here, or traveling abroad, I believe is really critical for to, to, to developing um, uh, as an adult. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any any other questions? What? what sorry, let me ask. What did, did she go with a university program? Yes. Was it ECCI? Berlin College. Huh. Right, Nancy Wow. Oh, that's great. They said that's an Ivan Dar. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'll, we'll talk after. This, yeah. Um. Chris. Could you tell um, a story about a thing that a volunteer's worked on? Um, yeah, okay. Well, we have a lot of volunteers. Um, let's see. We have, um, we have volunteers in the secondary education program. We have volunteers doing um, teacher training uh, and um, student direct student teaching. A lot of them are doing secondary activities with their students on uh, computer design, um, web development. Um, in, in many schools, like I, I walked into your classroom this morning, Chris, and I was blown away. I was like, look at all these computers. Do you, I, I'm so sorry that I don't have pictures of volunteers in their communities because I don't take, I don't bring pictures of volunteers with me for privacy reasons. You know, I, they haven't signed releases. There's a, believe me, there's a whole legal world out there to learn about. But, um, there isn't probably a school where a Peace Corps volunteer teaches in Tanzania where there are computers like this. And so many, many young Tanzanian students have never logged on. They don't know what the enter key or the start key is. They don't know what control alt delete does. Uh, they don't know, you know, control C, control B, control. I mean, that's all, that's another language. I mean, for you, for us, this is a part of our world, it's part of our language. So a lot of volunteers are developing computer labs with their schools. They're applying for grant funds from outside grant sources. Um, and they're working with students and teachers on improving the students' capacity and ability with computers. Um, connecting them in some ways, if possible, to the internet, which is opening up a whole new world for students. Additionally to that, then using computer technology for mapping, mapping, uh, agricultural uh, zones, mapping health.
health demographic information. Where are the clusters of malaria? Where are the high concentrations of HIV and AIDS taking place around the community? So it's a very interesting new application of technology for a rural Tanzanian school, but something that you guys are all... I mean, I used to say if you could balance a checkbook when I was a volunteer, if you could balance a checkbook, you could be a small business development volunteer. But now, I think if you could... If you can do what you guys can do on a computer, you could create a computer training program for a rural Tanzanian school. You don't have to be an expert. You know more than they know, and they desperately want to know what you know. Um, as an individual, as an American, and in a technical skill, they really, you know, the students really want to know that. And it's a great way to improve your ability to teach, your understanding of the world, and your connection to a new place. Um, so students are working on that. Students are doing really cool uh, agricultural work, um, creating uh, systems, of, or not systems, but creating um, uh, training programs on permagardening, we call it. So it's not permaculture, which is like this whole lifestyle change. You have to kind of live in this agricultural bubble. But it's, um, it's creating sustainable gardens at people's homes. Again, like I said before, so they don't have to go travel so far and be, kind of be at risk of... Um, you know, uh, uh, women, especially in uh, um, some communities, are at risk of assault and sexual assault. If they're traveling 10 kilometers to get firewood and, uh, and um, you know, work in the farm and they're all alone or they're with their kids, they're away from their homes, they're losing time at homes. So we train people to be able to do that stuff near their homes, which improves their home life. Um, uh, health, we have a health program in. Tanzania, it's called the Global Health Service Program. It's it's something that people do with advanced degrees in medical, uh, as a doctor or as a nurse, but they're training doctors and nurses in local hospitals. And it's really an amazing program. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff that people are doing. Uh, let me think. Um, yeah, there are some, uh, there's a great malaria program that most of our African countries has, have. Uh, it is focused on uh, reducing malaria prevalence in communities, so it's getting people to use bed nets when they're, when they're in malaria um, uh, areas. Um, it's uh, understanding how many, how many people, um, well, it's, it's primarily getting people to use bed nets, but it's also getting people to understand the symptoms of malaria and getting to medical services when the symptoms come up. So this malaria typically is, is, one of the major symptoms is a fever, but there's fevers for a lot of things. You can have food poisoning and have a fever, you can have diarrhea and have a fever, you can have typhoid, TB, a lot of things. So it's, um, people assume that when they have a fever, it's malaria, and so they'll treat for malaria, but you don't actually know if it's malaria. What if it's typhoid? What if it's something else that could be more dangerous, especially to a child under the age of five? So Peace Corps volunteers are helping connect, um, co helping connect uh, um, people to clinics, and then working with the clinics to provide outreach directly to people's homes, going to people's homes and bringing test kits so that they can actually test in the home. Does your child have malaria, or does your child have something else? So that's really cool, and that's saving thousands and thousands of lives every year in in many many Peace Corps countries in Africa. It's called Stomp Out Malaria. It's become really, really big now, very important. Um, any other questions about sort of general stuff? I'll, I'll go through some, you want to see some pictures? I take lots of pictures, and as Chris knows, and so. Um, so this up here is in Madagascar. It's on the east co on the west coast of Madagascar. I had never seen sunset like this before. This was unbelievable. And these guys are in a canoe about to go out fishing. Um, this is called a baobab tree. Baobab trees are among some of the oldest trees in the world and throughout Africa, southern Africa, there are many different species, but in, in Madagascar there are very unique species of baobab trees, like three different species. And, um, and these are birds' nests up in here, they're called weaver birds. And they weave the nests and it's pretty intricate depending on the type of bird. You have a different type of nest. It's pretty cool. Um, this is a gecko. Things are wild. This thing was like this big, uh, like you know, maybe nine 
nine inches or so. Um, this is in the Comoros. The fishermen bring their daily catch in, put it in a wheelbarrow. And this is tuna. A little tuna, a little yellowfin tuna. Very tasty. Um, and the Comoros is three islands, and the total population is about 750,000 people. And we have about 30 Peace Corps volunteers serving, mostly <coughs> in the secondary education. Uh, this is a living stone bat. The wingspan is about seven feet. So I am six foot nine. So the wingspan on this bat is, it's enormous. And they fly around in the day. Let me go figure. I mean, bats are nighttime animals, right? These things are like seagulls. You don't even see seagulls. They're all over the place. This was in the Comoros. This, uh, this is called Gobala Salama. This is the door of peace. And um, I, I kind of like this. They're building a basketball court. And this thing's uh, 1,500 years old. So right on the court where this old palace was in, the, in this island called Moroni, um, or, yeah, Moroni, in the Comoros, they're building a basketball court. And around it is the ruins of this ancient uh, um, thing. It's pretty cool. But this, the legend is... Uh, the, um, the, the Comoros, especially in Madagascar, if you read pir history of pirates, which I was fascinated with as a kid, um, their Madagascar and the Comoros were pirates were all over the place, and they used that as a stopping over point um, in the Indian Ocean and uh, and traveling around the Horn of Africa. Um, and uh, and the legend was that this, if you pass through this door before you went to fight the pirates, you would survive. I don't know how accurate it is, but the door is still there. Um, okay, ladies. Chanel number five? Yeah? You heard that? Smelled it? Yeah? Okay. All right, you might, you might, you, you're probably old enough to know what Chanel number five. This is the plant from which it comes. It's called Ylang Ylang. And it is, uh, it is uh, indigenous to East Africa, and it is one of the most amazing smells ever. You can try, walk through the forest and just breathe it in. And it's just incredible. And so um, women typically will pick the flowers when they're when they're ripe. This is a flower. And then it's boiled and distilled. And from it, you, you get this tiny, tiny bit of oil. And that's the basis of Chanel number no. 5. So if you go and, you know, if you don't have it, go find out if your mother, or grandmother, or aunt has it. That is, it's just, that's what the forest smells like. Again, in the Comoros, this is in the Comoros, but it, um, it's in Madagascar and all the East African coast. Uh, this is a refugee camp in western Rwanda, where refugees are living, have moved in from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, there's a lot of fighting in that uh, part of the world. Um, uh, some of it's tribal and ethnic, uh, largely it's political, but these folks have been pushed out of Rwanda into the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which we call the DRC, and then pushed back into Rwanda. And they're sort of kind of stateless. They don't have a place to go. And there's about 18,000 people that live in this camp. Um, and this is a, this is a, um, it was a big part of the um, uh, focus on refugee um, assistance for much of the 1990s. Um, Things have settled down largely, but there's still large populations of refugees in, in this part of the world. Uh, these are chickens going to market. You see, you'll see this all the time. Chickens hanging from bicycles. Um, this is in Mad this is in Rwanda here. Um, this is uh, this is Madagascar. Uh, this is I guess their students going to school. Maybe he's got a backpack on. Um, rice farming, or actually, this is tea in Rwanda. Rwanda is like, it's called the land of a thousand hills, and um, it's just forest and farms everywhere, it's beautiful. Rwanda is a former Belgian colony. Now, have you heard about Rwanda and the genocide? Um, Rwanda is, um, is sort of ground zero for the most recent genocidal uh, acts about uh, well, we just had the 20th anniversary of the genocide then last year. So 21 years ago, um, the Hutus murdered almost a million Tutsi. And um, uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a brutal 
you know, to go there, every community has a genocide memorial where they have bones that are buried. There's a National Genocide Museum. Um, the president, uh, uh, well, every, uh, every year they have a big genocide uh, memorial day, uh, celebration, the memorial day. Um, but it's part of the fabric of the country. It's a very living um, uh, ex experience. And their commitment to not going through it again is very deep, runs very deep. In the um, these are in the Comoros. I attended a wedding recently. Uh, it's called the Grand Mariage in French, or the Big Marriage. And this is the groom and the bride, and these are their two children. So they got married sort of in a traditional way, and now they, uh, they've been married for, I think, four or five years. I don't know how old these children are. But now they're getting married in the, in the, in the um, sort of in the more traditional, um, um, uh, I guess, it's sort of a mix of Islam and local culture, or local tradition. Uh, and and the, these, um, I can't remember the word they have for it in the Comoros, but this kanzu in, in Swahili, the black kanzu, means that a man has already been through this grand mariage. And it's a very uh, an, um, elaborate process where the, the, the groom goes to the bride's house and he's with this hordes of hordes of people and he has to ask for the bride and the, you know, and then he's, He's you know begging the father or asking the father, and finally the father, uh, you know, agrees, and then the groom, uh, bride comes with hundreds of her people, and and then you know there were probably 500 people at this wedding. It was amazing, um, and I was right on the floor. I had the, I had the front row seats. I didn't mean to be there. I didn't know I was going to be there. Suddenly I'm in this room dripping with sweat, and this all this guy's uncles and everyone were asking the father, can this guy marry your daughter? Now, of course, they're already married, but this is the official, you know, marriage. Um, it was an amazing experience. Um, and he's got a sword here. And, no, it was pretty wild. This is Madagascar. Um, and uh, this is also on the Comoros. Uh, you see, the, the women have this yellow mask on their face. Uh, it's sandalwood. It's a a wood that they grind into a powder, and um, and it's a beauty treatment that the women use. It's also a sunblock because it's very hot and sunny. So they'll have this on, and it has it has a beautiful odor to it too. So I'm sure there's a perfume effect. Um, but they were making uh, food for another wedding, not this wedding, uh, but another wedding that was going to take place that night. So. Uh, this is Rwanda, man. This is this is great. Uh, this is my daughter Maria. She's she's um, 17. She's going to be going to university next year somewhere here. And we went trekking to see the gorillas uh, and the golden monkeys. These guys are great. These golden monkeys are just crazy. They're running all over, and they eat all they eat is bamboo. So they'll rip down the bamboo, chew on it for minutes, throw it aside, go find another one. And uh, and look, I mean, I have long lenses. I have shoot with long lenses, but I was only. 10 feet from this big one. And this guy walked right by me, the little one. I mean, you're not supposed to touch him because if you touch this, this one will then <laughs> rip your head off, I suppose. Uh, but this is a silverback gorilla. Um, and there are, I, I don't remember how many families, but in the Barunga National Park, there are um, a certain, maybe 10 or 15 family groups of gorillas. They're endangered. There are only 700 or so left. Uh, this is local transportation in Rwanda. Look at that baby there, little guy. Born about three weeks before I shot the picture. And this is a yawn. This is not anyone pissed off of me. And that's in Botswana, in the, in the Okavango Delta. When we were in the boat and we came around the corner and there's this elephant right in front of us. Um, Madagascar, this is a lady that cooked our breakfast and uh, she got a picture taken. Um, Malawi, wild mushrooms, just these huge mushrooms, beautiful mushrooms. Um, anyone know what this is? Yeah, big black scorpion, things like this big. These are the chame some of the chameleons. Oh, I had the chickens again. Uh, this is the Comoros, this is like outside my hotel room. Shrimp, this woman measuring shrimp. Okay, looks like that's it.
I could have shown hundreds of pictures alone, but uh, anyway, um, I guess to sum it up, I would encourage you to think about the world, think about community service, national community service, or international community service. Peace Corps is a great way to do it. I thought I was going to go and live in Africa on my own, and I was saving money to go do it. And then I realized, I can, I can get someone to train me, train me in the language, learn the culture, safety and security training, pay for my ticket, my housing. I'd rather do it like that than pay my own way. So that's a great way to do it. Um, anyway, any other questions? Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah.